Welcome, everyone. I'm Carol McNeil. Good to have you with me this evening. The New York Times is defending itself for a profile piece it did on a Nazi sympathizer. Some people say the article itself was way too soft and sympathetic. Others think it was the right thing to do. The New York Times profile was of a neo-Nazi from Ohio. The depiction of a white supremacist as a fig innocuous figure has drawn significant backlash over the past few days. That was the that was the accusation anyway. The story titled was titled A Voice of Hate in America's Heartland. It depicted the life of 29-year-old pro-Nazi Tony Hoviter. The piece highlights his love of Seinfeld and music while touching on some of his most abhorrent views. Several people accused the Times of normalizing white nationalism and extremism. The newspaper says it regrets how the story came across to some readers but stands by its decision to try to highlight the extreme corners of American life. We've reached out to the New York Times, but national editor Mark Lacey declined our request to come on the program tonight. But we're going to bring it up with our panel because we know lots of people are talking about this issue tonight. Tasha Carradine is the host of The Tasha Carradine Show, and Muniza Sheikh is an employment lawyer and partner with Levitt LLP. Welcome once again to you both. Hi, Carol. Hello. Okay, what, what did you think? Uh, Muniza, I'm going to start with you. What did you think of this profile piece? Okay, so the first thing I want to say is I do agree that ex, you know exposing extremist opinions to public scrutiny is the best way to deal with hate. The problem I have with articles like this one is um, what you see is really the media energizing you know fringe racism, and that is what I have a problem with. I can also How tell so? you what do you mean energizing? Well, so, so I can tell you as a Muslim Canadian and as a human rights lawyer, I found the tone of the article to be extremely offensive. But what I mean by energizing fringe uh, racist is it's let's, let's leave aside the issue of normalizing the hate in the U.S. What I have a bigger problem with is individuals like the man who was profiled, they're being lent a voice, a platform, they're giving credibility and empowerment that they otherwise did not have. Think of it this way, Carol, like years ago, publicly identifying as a racist would have political, financial, social implications. And now because of this current climate and articles like this don't help, what you're seeing instead is you know, uh, you know, people in the U.S., you know, individuals like this, you know, uh, this per particular person saying, I'm a racist, come and interview me. I think the, the media coverage has been amazing, and I don't mean that in a good way. Okay, Tasha, what did you think? Do you hold the same opinion? No, I don't. Um, I think it's actually very important to expose the banality of racism because we assume that it is only people who stand on rooftops and scream and, uh, you know, say horrible things are racist. There are racists next door. There are racists everywhere. Um, you know, the New York Post, just to compare, did a profile of three young women who went to join ISIS back in May who had very abhorrent views as well. Um, no one said anything. And the, uh, you know, we profile mass killers. We delve into, you know, why did Adam Lanza kill all those children in Sandy Hook? We're not saying that we're lionizing him. I think the, the like I said, this piece to me, um, it is horrible to read because you see that your neighbor, a person, any person potentially could have these views. It is important for us to know that. And I say this as someone, you know, whose family was very affected um, by the Nazis. My grandfather was picked up by the Nazis in Germany, um, you know, but it was exactly this kind of thing that led to that, is that the ordinary person had these views and people didn't stand up and denounce them. And to know that the ordinary person can have these views, to me, is very important. So I think the Times, I, I can see why some people would criticize it, but I think they did the right thing in publishing this piece. Muniza? Um, I think the comments around, I, I mean, so so the Times, the New York Times, like as you had mentioned, Carol, did issue an apology of sorts, kind of, well, we're sorry you were offended, yeah, but can, you know, we didn't I mean can, it that I way. I can actually read it. The regret, right. uh, the, we regret the degree to which the piece offended so many readers. We recognize that people to, can disagree on how best to tell a disagreeable story. What we think is indisputable, though, is the need to shed more light, not less, on the most extreme corners of American life and the people 
people who inhabit them. That's what the story, however imperfectly, tried to do. So let me say this then, Carol. So in response to what the Times has said, and, and really in response also to what Tasha has just raised, this article did not teach me anything. Reading this article uh, taught me nothing about modern neo-Nazis. Yes, I know some of them have tattoos, they like cats and they go grocery shopping. But other than that, in reading this article, it didn't teach me anything. What I would want to read in an article like this, particularly when you see this sort of coverage, this sort of substantive profiling, I want to know what is it that feeds that hate? And so, you know, while the New York Times is saying, well, you know, we want you to know that the racist could be the person living next door. The problem is I read the article and I didn't get that. And I, and I, that still, I don't understand why this individual that was profiled, I don't understand what fuels his hate. It didn't answer that question for me. Well, I went into, the article did talk about how he changed from having uh, left-leaning views to having uh, more right-leaning views. He said based on the tour, he went on with his rock band where he went to Appalachia and he saw mm. people there, uh, the sort of tip, stereotypical Trump voter, people who have been left behind by the new economy and people who felt that Trump, uh, rightly or wrongly, spoke for them. And that's what fueled his change. And that is, to me, was very interesting because this Times had published an earlier piece as well that I remember reading around the time of the election about a man who voted for Donald Trump and who, uh, on the surface of it, was just, you know, your ordinary guy. But online, he said some horribly racist and nasty things. He was also like, you know, your neighbor. But when you really scratch the surface, his motivations for his views were profoundly awful. Um, so I think it is important to know that there is, unfortunately, there are people in America right now who are motivated, um, sort of twisting the sense that they feel hard done by. In this case, he says, you know, white people are hard done by. That is the justification that he advances in this article for his views, that one has to know that that's out there. If one doesn't know that's out there, it's very easy just to dismiss the Trump phenomenon is maybe a one election thing. I, I fear that it may not be. Lisa, My, I wonder if there isn't. You, you talk about the article not, uh, you know, having that moment. I mean, it did go into explored what he called his political awakening. Authors Charles Murray, Pat Buchanan, um, what he perceives as malice directed at white people in the media. Um, but I wonder if the 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 piece itself reveals the fact that there was no big issue in his life that Absolutely. he was turned by a combination of things right. that he perceived. And Carol, that's what I took away from the article. What I saw in the article, notwithstanding, of course, the points that Tasha has mentioned, and of course, it's indisputable that that was in there, I saw more of an emphasis on he has cats, he likes Seinfeld, he goes grocery shopping, he has tattoos, he's your guy mm -hmm. next door. But more importantly than that, Carol, I, uh, what I saw um, is, you know, and this is what's fueled by articles like this, at least in my view, is I saw a shameless self promotion. And that's what I think is so dangerous. He was proud to be a racist, fully aware of the fact that this was going to be published and this was going to get a lot of attention. And he didn't even temper himself, you know, made egregious, callous remarks yep. about, you know, Jewish people, about, you know, uh, you know, flippant remarks about, you know, homosexuals. So, I mean, he didn't even use this opportunity to temper his remarks. And instead, he's like, thanks for the platform. Let me say these hideous things. And like I said, all I saw, all I left with was this sense of shameless self-promotion. And I think that that is the issue because you again have all of these racists which you know now there's been so much cover uh, coverage on it because it's so easy to link it to the Trump administration who are really um, essentially in a position where they don't have to deal with the social the financial consequences of what and in some cases unlawful consequences that you would have had to deal with prior to Trump well I don't know if they would have had unlawful consequences I think of other examples. people say racist and awful things all the time I mean Omar Khadr's family was interviewed a while ago a long time ago that interview still lives on uh, with his sister saying extremely racist and nasty things um, it, the, people say things that we don't like and in this case uh, this man is espousing all sorts of pro Nazi beliefs and yes they are awful but the point is that he is comfortable saying them not simply because uh, there are people who may agree with him out there reading this article probably not many the New York Times isn't really known for being you know pro-nazi thankfully but uh, there are people online and I think the online community is also a big piece of this when you notice how he speaks to the reporter is very different than how he speaks on the internet that is where a lot of these people find each other and that to me was something I took away from the piece as well that was very interesting to see look you know people can present as if they are just you know your average person uh, but if you look at what they say when they think only people that agree with them are looking as in this this man, 
they may reveal their true selves. And that also is instructive to combat hatred. You have to know where to look. And I think that's what I took away from the article, you know, beyond the, the Seinfeld reference that uh, Muniza pointed out. Yeah, it, let me just bring this to the table. This was Sean, uh, Shane Bauer of Mother Jones wrote. Um, again, not a place where Nazis, uh, you know, gather to read. People mad about this article want to believe that Nazis are monsters we cannot relate to. White supremacists are normal ass white people, and it's been that way in America since 1776. Yeah. We will continue to be in trouble until we understand that. Uh, Manisa, is it important to know that evil acts can be perpetrated and supported by people um, who, who seem very normal and watch Seinfeld and have cats? Of course, uh, it's important, but I can tell you, again, as a human rights lawyer, as a Muslim Canadian, as someone who's concerned about, you know, um, you know anybody who's propagating hate against uh, anyone who's not white, I think the New York Times could have, uh, you know, tempered the article a bit. I think there could have been more focus on some of the activities that he, um, some of the activities in, he's involved in, talked a little bit more about his history without couching the narrative as sympathetic as it was. And look, we know this, right? Because we have uh, the author, uh, I believe he issued an article, I think it was the next day, saying much of what I'm saying right now, which is, look, I struggled with this, and, you know, I sent various drafts in, and, you know, we struggled with the tone. So I think for them to take a step back now and say, well, we apologize if it hurt your feelings, but we stand by it, it's a little disingenuous because they're admitting that they too struggled with the tone. And, you know, from a PR perspective, Perspective worried about you know the impression that would give. I think well, I think that the you know the fact that it's generating debate. Obviously, some people read it and took it that way and said this is glorifying or normalizing. Let's say normalizing is the word they use. Um, I think that like I said to me, maybe my takeaway is different, but the banality of it was the, sh the most terrifying thing to me, um, and it's something I think that the tone conveyed. If a tone had been extremely condemning, um, it would not have conveyed the same sense of, gee, you know what? You have to see that this can be this can be anywhere, and this <clears throat> is anywhere potentially in society. And I disagree that it was a sympathetic tone. It was a, a more neutral tone. I think that that was the issue. It was a neutral tone. Um, at no point did the author say, you know, I agree with this. He in fact said no. most Americans would disagree. Most Americans would find this horrible. But here's this guy. Yeah. I, I, okay, well, we have to leave it there. This is a great conversation. I'm sorry we have to leave it there. We can keep going. Tasha Carradine, the host of the Tasha Carradine Show, and Maniza Sheikh, an employment lawyer and uh, partner with Levitt LLP and also human rights lawyer. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. Okay. Coming up, three years after the last Canadian troops withdrew from Afghanistan, a former MP is asking the International Criminal Court to investigate our country's connection to possible war crimes. Murray Brewster explains next.